Our next speaker is a British astrophysicist who's also a member of that country's House of Lords. He's published more than 500 papers, written eight books, and currently his uh, focus is high-energy astrophysics. Unfortunately, he could not be with us here today, but he has sent a video of the talk that he was going to present. So my friends, please welcome Dr. Martin Rees. Well, greetings to everyone. I'm really sorry I'm in Cambridge and can't join you, and I'm missing the wonderful Starmos Festival. I have been to previous ones, and I hugely admire what's been done by the two great impresarios, Garrick and Brian. They're both great artists and scientists, and Brian has the extra advantage that he looks more like Newton than any other scientist I know. So it's great to be in touch. I'm sorry I'm not with you. We're all aware that we are the outcome of four billion years of evolution by Darwinian selection. And most people think that we humans are the culmination, the top of the tree. But no astronomer can believe that because the sun's not even halfway through its life, and the cosmos will go on much longer, maybe even forever. And to quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. So humans may be an early stage in the emergence of ever more wonderful complexity in the cosmos. And I'm going to speculate not about the very far future, but about space flight in the human and the post-human era. But let's start with the near term. The Apollo program, humans' first footprint on another world, was an epochal event. Charlie Duke and his fellow astronauts were heroes. They accepted high risks and they pushed technology to the limit. There have been huge advances since then in space technology, of course. We depend on it every day for sat-nav, communications, and so forth. And it's led to wonderful scientific discoveries. But only now, 50 plus years after Apollo, are there plans for a human return to the moon. The US is spending $90 billion on the Artemis program, which is touted as a precursor of human voyages to Mars. But at the risk of being unpopular with this audience, I'd like to explain why I don't think we taxpayers should fund any such venture. Unlike in the Apollo era, we now have robotic explorers, exemplified by the rovers on Mars, where the American Perseverance and its Chinese counterpart can drive through rocky terrain with only limited guidance from the Earth. Within 10 or 20 years, AI advances will close the gap between robotic and human capabilities, rendering human flights to Mars even poorer practical or scientific value. Moreover, flotillas of robotic craft could explore the planets and moons of the outer solar system with little extra expense. Multi-year journeys present little more challenge to a robot than the six-month voyage to Mars. The next step will be the deployment in space of robotic fabricators, which can build large structures. For instance, giant successors to the James Webb Telescope with huge gossamer thin mirrors. And these will further enhance our imaging of exoplanets and the wider cosmos. So the practical case for human spaceflight gets ever weaker with each advance in robots and miniaturization. And astronauts, of course, need far more maintenance than robots. It require air, water, food, living space, and protection against harmful radiation. Moreover, 
safety and reliability standards must be more stringent and therefore more expensive when human lives are at stake. Already substantial for a trip to the moon, the cost ratio between sending humans and sending robots gets even larger for any really long mission. A Martian mission, taking six months to get there, and including provisions and rocketry for the return trip, could cost way up close to a trillion dollars. And that cost would rise because NASA has developed a safety culture, a response to the national trauma that followed the space shuttle disasters in 1985 and 1993, which each killed the seven civilians on board. But the shuttle was launched 135 times, and that represents a failure of less than 2%. But it had unwisely been promoted as a safe venture for civilians. So each failure was followed by a hiatus when efforts were made to make the risks even smaller. And it would be utterly unrealistic to expect that a risk of a trip to the moon and back was less than 2%. But many thrill seekers and adventurers would willingly accept high risks even if american citizens won't and therefore cut price trips to mars bankrolled by billionaires and private sponsors could be crewed by willing volunteers the public wouldn't be paying and would cheer on these brave adventurers so as an american or european I'd argue that inspirationally led private companies should front all human missions beyond low Earth orbit as cut price, high risk ventures. Because there'd still be many volunteers, some perhaps accepting one way tickets driven by the same motives as early explorers, mountaineers and the like. So by 2100, Thrill seekers and adventurers may have established a base on Mars. It would be in some sort of bubble or maybe in a cave. And Elon Musk says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. He's 52 years old and the best of luck to him. But don't ever expect mass emigration from Earth. And here I disagree with Musk, Zubrin and others who advocate rapid build-up of large-scale Martian communities. It's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from Earth problems. We've got to solve these here. Coping with climate change may seem daunting, but it's a doddle compared to making Mars terraformed. No way in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic, the ocean bed, or the top of Everest. There's no planet B for ordinary risk averse people. But we humans should cheer on these risk taking space adventurers who may have gone to Mars because they will have a pivotal role in humanity's long term future. And that's my next theme. The pioneer Martian explorers will be badly adapted to their new habitat. So they have a compelling reason to redesign themselves, exploiting the super powerful genetic and cyborg technologies that will be developed in coming decades. These techniques will, one hopes, be heavily regulated on Earth on prudential and ethical grounds. But the settlers on Mars will be far beyond the clutches of the regulators. And we should surely wish them good luck in modifying their progeny to adapt to these unearthly environments. And eventually, they'd become a new species. So it's these spacefaring adventurers, not those of us comfortably adapted to life on Earth, who will spearhead the post human era. Their population will evolve, not via Darwinian selection, but by the much faster process 
I'd call secular intelligent design. What will they be like? There are chemical and metabolic limits to the size and processing power of flesh and blood brains. Maybe we're close to these already, but no such limits constrain electronic computers. So, even though we're perhaps near the end of Darwinian evolution, technological evolution of intelligent beings is only just beginning, and it'll happen fastest away from the Earth. I wouldn't expect and certainly wouldn't wish for such rapid changes in humanity here on the Earth, to which we are well adapted. We humans thrive on the planetary surface, but if post-humans make the transition to fully inorganic intelligences, they won't need an atmosphere, and they may prefer zero-g, especially for constructing massive artefacts. So it's in deep space, not on Earth, nor even on Mars, that non-biological brains may develop powers that humans can't even imagine. Their evolution will be many lifetimes, but ultra-rapid compared to the timescales of the Darwinian selection that led to humanity's emergence. And remember that even more billions of years lie ahead than have elapsed already. So the outcome of future technological evolution could surpass humans by as much as we intellectually surpass slime mold. What about consciousness? Philosophers debate whether consciousness is special to the wet organic brains of humans, apes and dogs. Might it be that even if their capabilities seem superhuman, AI will still lack self-awareness or inner life? Or is consciousness emergent in any sufficiently complex network. Some say this is irrelevant and semantic, like asking whether submarines swim. But I don't think it is. This question crucially affects how we react to the far future scenario I've sketched. If electronic robots are zombies, we'd not accord their experiences the same value as ours and the post-human future would seem bleak. But if they're conscious, we should surely welcome the prospect of their eventual dominance. Even if life had only originated on the Earth, it need not, in the long run, remain a trivial feature of the cosmos. Humans could jumpstart a diaspora, whereby ever more complex intelligence spreads through the galaxy far transcending our limitations. The leap to labouring stars is just an early step in the process. Interstellar voyages would hold no terrors for near immortals. But thanks to Professor Mayor and his colleagues, we know that there are millions of Earth-like planets spread through the galaxy. So the great question, of course, is, is ET out there already? We'd all agree that we don't know, or maybe almost all. I get letters from people who say they've met the aliens, have been abducted by them, etc. I express skepticism and tell these people to write to each other and not to me. I'm not convinced by any of them. But nonetheless, the aliens may be out there, even if we haven't found them yet. Although it may be such a rare event, like winning a lottery that it hasn't occurred anywhere else. That will disappoint the SETI searchers, of course. Well, if we aren't alone, what sort of evidence would we expect to find? Suppose that there are indeed many other planets where life began and on some of which Darwinian evolution followed a similar track to what's happened here. Even then, it's unlikely that the key stages would be synchronized. If the immersion of intelligence and technology on a planet lags significantly behind what's happened on Earth, because the planet is younger, or because the bottlenecks of evolution have taken longer to negotiate, then that planet would plainly reveal no evidence of ET today. 
But around a star older than the sun, life could have had a head start of a billion years or more. The history of human technological civilization is measured in thousands of years, millennia at most. And it may be less than one millennia more before humans are overtaken or transcended by inorganic intelligence, which will then persist, continuing to evolve on a faster than Darwinian time scale for billions of years. Organic human level intelligence is generically just a brief interlude before the machines take over. So, if intelligence on another world evolved as it might here, we'd be most unlikely to catch it in a brief sliver of time when it was still embodied in a flesh and blood civilization. Were we to detect ET, it would be far more likely to be electronic, where the dominant creatures aren't flesh and blood and aren't on planets. And remember, that's a billion years is a million millennia. We must then drastically reinterpret the Drake equation. The lifetime of an organic high-tech civilization may be millennia at most, but its electronic diaspora will continue millions of times longer. And this vast time span should make us more optimistic about a successful SETI search. Incidentally, I am very positive about SETI. I chair the advisory board of Breakthrough Listen, which is the project funded by Yuri Milner to improve the chances of searching uh, for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, if there were these very, very long-lived uh, non-organic civilizations, does this aggravate the so-called Fermi paradox? That's the idea that if there were uh, entities which were more, more intelligent than us or more advanced than us, they would have come here. Why aren't they here already? Why haven't they come and eaten us? Well, I think it doesn't necessarily do that. That's because Darwinian evolution, which led to us, favors intelligence, but also aggression. But this post-human evolution of machines designing more intelligent machines may not be aggressive or expansionist. Needing neither gravity nor an atmosphere, these entities would not be on planets. They may be living a conservative life out there in huge numbers. But they may be detectable and survive far, far longer, even though less conspicuously than their flesh and blood precursors did. Just a few final thoughts. All I've said now is consistent with the laws of physics and the cosmological models as we understand them today. But we should surely be open-minded about the possibility that there's much more we don't understand. Human brains have changed little since our ancestors roamed the African savannas and coped with the challenges that life there presented them. And it's surely remarkable that those brains have allowed us to make sense of the quantum and the cosmos, far removed from the common sense everyday world in which we evolved. And scientific frontiers, as we know, are advancing excitingly fast. Answers to many current mysteries will surely come to focus. But human comprehension may sometime hit the buffers. There may be phenomena crucial to our long-term destiny that we're not aware of any more than a monkey comprehends the quantum world. So physical reality could encompass complexities that neither our intellects nor our senses can grasp. Future AI systems may have a quite different concept of reality, nor can we predict or understand their motives. That's why we can't assess whether the great silence, the lack of steady signals, signifies their absence of another worlds, or simply their preference for a quiet, contemplative life out there. So, to conclude, conjectures about advanced intelligence are far more shaky than those about simple life. 
if it's evolved, in other words, with a head start, I conjecture three things about the entities that SETI searches could reveal. First, they will not be organic or biological. Secondly, they won't remain on the planet where their biological precursors lived. But thirdly, we won't be able to fathom their motives or their intentions. And there, I think I'll stop because science fiction writers can tell us far more and be more enlightening. Thank you very much for listening.